Um, so we, let's, let's dive quickly into the questions that are asked. Um, anonymous. Culture, architecture and use of building evolve through time. How do you define architecture? How do you define heritage authenticity in this context? Maybe uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Alfred. C'est une question très philosophique. C'est une question très philosophique. Et la, la question de l'authenticité, euh, j'ai essayé de montrer dans, dans une des diapositives que euh, l'histoire ne s'arrête pas. Les œuvres changent et, et le... Et le L'authenticité, elle, elle est très, comment dire, elle est très, très, très temporelle, quoi. C'est-à-dire que c'est pas une valeur universelle. C'est une question très difficile à répondre. It's a, it's a very difficult question to answer. First of all, um, I've shown in one of my slides that um, history doesn't change. Um, works, masterpieces may change, but um, authentic, authenticity is. Um, it's in the time, in a uh, temporal, but it doesn't, it's, it, there's no universal value in that, in authenticity. This is a very difficult question. You want to ask the first question? Ah, oui. She's in French, I can't read yeah. French. Ah, okay, uh, okay. So okay. No, première question. So if um, heritage is a dialogue between uh, human um, works, masterpieces, and um, territory, so how can we, ah, in, in the face of um, climate changes, how do we save our um, heritage, static heritage? C'est une, une, une question plus simple que la, la première parce que cette question de l'adaptation la, euh, au changement climatique euh, est une... Euh, est une euh, Comment dire, quelque chose de factuel. Donc, on est dans une, dans une relation qui, 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 est beaucoup plus, enfin, qui est beaucoup plus saisissable architecturalement, je dirais. Et It's um, simpler than the first one. Um, this is a factual, um, uh, it's a fact that we have to face today, um, adaptation uh, to climate changes. So the relationship um, is more uh, tangible in this case. I'll just talk about that, I think. Right. Save time. Yeah. Um, thanks for this question. Actually, it's a little bit... Um, Oh, I can answer both questions together. Actually, the, 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 to talk about the designs as gradual Arabization is a bit anachronistic because the Indo-Saracenic colonial architecture that you see built for mosques in the 20s and 1920s and 1930s, uh, they were built by colonial architects, nothing to do with Arabization. If anything, it shows instead the kind of misassumptions or what they are familiar with. So colonial architects from British India or Dutch architects, they were familiar only with the kinds of Islamic architecture that has been can canonized in books like Bannister Fletcher's. So when they refer to Bannister Fletcher, how to design, or when they refer to their colonies like British India, Mughal, and then for the French is uh, Moroccan, yeah? Moorish. So then they, 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 they do a mishmash of it. That's got nothing to do with Arabization actually. So it's a colonial uh, importation, if you like, imposition even. And then um, if you, what was it? Huh? The Southeast Asian designs. It's got to do with the fact that the colonial architects are not familiar with how to build the South Asian idiom. 
If you look at uh, the uh, Netherlands East Indies, Indonesia today, you go to certain towns where the Dutch tried to build these. They look simple, right? Just stack the roofs. But actually, if you look in the interior, the Javanese mode of construction is very economical. The use of timber is very slight, but it can huge. Can, you wouldn't believe it, but one of the two mosques I showed you from Sumatra, for comparison, is taller than the Blue Mosque in Istanbul. I know you wouldn't believe it, but it is. It's taller than the Blue Mosque in Istanbul. So we are very accustomed to only be looking at stone mosques as monumental. We don't think of the Southeast Asian ones as, so, as being so. They were just as huge and very difficult to build in timber without cranes and whatnot. Unlike stone, you can stack it up. But for timber, you have to erect it. Mind you, that's, even, that's, that's completely different mechanics. And, and today, if you want to talk about Arabization, the, the community today might be you arguably, in terms of dress, Arabized, but the mosques are not. The mosques begin to look like malls and community centers, don't you think? All right, let me the, the, the question uh, that just came up. So your presentation is overwhelmingly focused on Mal Malay it, heritage. It what are the diverse heritage left to us by the British, Chinese, Indian uh, forefathers? Yeah, I tried to, because I had only the amount of time I had, I tried to show those that were demolished for the areas surrounding Chinatown and the areas surrounding Kampung Glam. It so happens that in both cases, it's overwhelmingly Tamil Muslim or Malay or uh, Southeast Asian Muslim, different groups. Yeah, that's my short answer. Uh, if you ask, there's, there's a second part, right? So what did they leave? Diverse heritage left to us by British, Chinese and Indian. Well, it was also in my presentation, just that I didn't articulate it. You could have seen for one of the maps, I showed all the different Joss houses shown in one particular map. I don't know whether you noticed that. All the different dialect groups, I listed it. But I just didn't have time to go through each one and each and every one of them. And um, if you want to know more, you know there's this website called what nanyangtemplearchitecture.com? <laughs> it's all there. And on, on the other hand, if you look at mosques or Hindu temples, the record is very poor. So I focus my attention on this. Yeah, that's the reason. All right, I think there's one that I think the, in relation, I think, to uh, what uh, Mr. Alfred Peters talked about. Uh, he he yeah, there all these examples of uh, conservation work in, in uh, Europe uh, that doesn't have the, the, the confines of uh, spaces, uh, whereas in Singapore we do. Uh, so we tear down, there's this, uh, you know, we, the, the reason why you are concerned with uh, uh, connection to place is because you know buildings get torn up, uh, torn up every 30 years. So maybe this question that uh, is posed to Imran, maybe you can answer it. There's um, um, about something about space here, right? It's not working. Okay. There was a question here about about space. I think somehow it disappeared. Can I click it? Mm. Sorry. Doesn't help. <laughs> anyway, let us go through the questions. Okay, uh, how are we to determine what heritage is worthy to conserve and what is, of course, appropriate and a fair methodology? Maybe uh, we, we ask uh, Mr. Peters and then after that, uh, Imran can answer. C'est une question très importante et euh, je crois que dans toute politique de conservation, la question essentielle est qu'est-ce que je veux transmettre à la génération future, qu'est-ce qui est important à transmettre et quels sont les éléments que je dois absolument leur transmettre. C'est ça qui détermine si oui ou non on démolit ou on ne démolit pas. So this question um, is very important because I think in all conservation policies, we should take into consideration uh, what we want to transmit to the future generation and what are the important elements, what are the aspects that we want to transmit and that's how we determine um, which buildings to conserve. L'histoire euh, en elle-même, le fait que ce soit ancien, ne peut pas déterminer à lui seul qu'on doit le garder. History can't determine that we must keep something or must keep a building. So, you know, there are all other aspects to consider. Um, 
That's an interesting question because fairness is a bit difficult to. Hmm, sounds like a, but um, to determine what to conserve, I don't know. I suppose I suppose one way to think about it is that we ask ourselves what kind of new development will replace it. We kind of know the answer. Uh, it will be more old chunkies and more. Uh, am I right? I mean, the chain stores in the malls. This is proliferating. Whenever you demolish something, you replace it with that or something similar. So it's a, it's a kind of franchising network of real estate players or condominiums, right? So these con now there's a I can, I can tie it with this thing about uh, we've got land restriction in Singapore. That's a myth because there are so many places in Singapore that are still retained uh, that are low lying and they they they, they you know they they are single story, double story, but they are kept. Nobody talks about them. Right? And then we are demolishing things that are taller. So it's a little bit strange. I won't go into the details. You just go and look that up yourselves because that's the paradox. The other thing has to do with the fact that when we demolish something, very often the land lies fallow for 20 years or more. Do we really need that land then? What, I mean, what, what is that about? I mean, don't tell me it's like reclaimed land, you need it to stabilize. It's not. So I, I, that, that's something else then. I mean, there are other reasons for it, um, which I won't elaborate. But it, it, that's a myth because really, if you really did the calculation, it's not really the case when something is demolished it's because you really, really need the land. Um, the answer to this whole uh, uh, whether, whether something needs to be conserved is whether it protects or furthers economic variety and social cultural diversity. If it does, then I think you will give it a higher priority, right? You're talking about diversity, social cultural diversity or economic variety. Variety, I mean variety. So, it used to be that, you know, we only stopped building the HDB complexes in town in 1983. Before that, this was pretty much a semi-socialist regime. You built public housing right in town. Can you imagine? Bras Basa complex, Hong Lim complex. Today, what, what prices would these fetch? So, these places are containers for the people who got displaced elsewhere and they operate all sorts of shops there and eateries. That's, that's the kind of diversity you still get. And when you go to Chinatown Heritage, uh, you know, the new heritage center behind Buddha Tooth Relic Temple, all the old people who stay around there, they are the ones who populate the public spaces. The only locals who are there. Otherwise, it's tourist land. Yeah. Okay, I think another question just came up. Uh, it's for Mr. Peters. Uh, could you suggest a sophisticated approach to real life in Singapore? Uh, Dr. Imran's uh, issue about integration of racial heritage in districts. What was the suggestion here that uh, we don't have a very sophisticated technique now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I think that this diversity, which is a real richness in Singapore, it doesn't need to be détruite dans une forme de banalité moderne. Quoi. Donc, euh, je pense que c'est euh, très, très intéressant de voir comment euh, aujourd'hui cette, cette richesse, est, elle est, on sent qu'elle est menacée et qu'il faut... Euh, je ne connais pas assez Singapour pour vous donner un conseil sur une méthode à utiliser, mais garder précieusement ce multiculturalisme pour éviter de vous retrouver dans une ville d'une totale banalité. I think uh, diversity is a richness in Singapore, and we should not destroy it, and we should not just look at it uh, in a uh, in a ba uh, ordinary way, a banal way. And it's interesting to see how this richness, which is threatened um, easily uh, today, uh, so I don't have. My, con my um, advice would be to keep this multiculturalism. Je trouve que le modèle le plus intéressant que je connaisse dans ce domaine, c'est Toronto, au Canada, qui est une ville qui revendique vraiment cette, euh, cette euh, mosaïque multiculturelle dans, sa, dans son développement urbain. Et ça a donné une ville que je trouve extrêmement vivable justement parce que euh, construite sur ce principe de la diversité. And a very good example that I can think, a model that I can think of is Toronto in Canada. 
and uh, where you find this mosaic of uh, multiculturalism in um, urban development. And Toronto is a very livable city, and it's also because of this device, uh, diversity. Imran, I think maybe to uh, address that question, maybe you should answer the last one uh, that's up here. Conservation decision from bottom-up approach, is this an ideology or possibility? Is this going to add sophistication to our very monolithic way of conservation? Where are you reading from? Oh, I'm reading from here, yeah, the, the last one. Ah. <laughs> Conservation decision from bottom up approach. Is it an ideology or a possibility? Ah. That's why that last slide, why I, I didn't even have time to talk about it. Um, let me see. Actually, I was going to. Uh, the, the thing about. Uh, where was it? Uh? The, the racial heritage. Oh, the, the more sophisticated methodology. Yeah, precisely. It's, it's answered together, right? When we talk about decision making, uh, well, it, it's, it's self evident. When you have top down, it means you only have the opinions and ideas of a select few who may not know everything there is on the ground. So why not tap the resources of those who know, whether they be communities or historians or enthusiasts or whatever it is? I know this. Now, in the past, the, the answer to this was that no, we are the technocrats. We know what to do. We are the planners. You know, we don't need your input. But that's what I'm saying. Today, we no longer live in that kind of situation. That used to be the old high modernist ethos, you know, the rationalist approach, which today we are, we're trying to kind of, we're trying to go with one leg still in the modernist, rationalist high ethos, you know, while trying to say we want to be culturally sophisticated. You can't be both. You have to start saying we let go of this very, um, uh, very top down statist approach and start to look, enter into a dialogue with the bottom up approach. In particular, when we talk about the diversity, I'm not saying that you can't talk about uh, the area where we are at as a, uh, an area of significance every year for Chinese New Year, for example. It is, of course. But what I'm saying is that within that narrative, there seems to be no room to talk about its diversity, which you can see around you in street names, in buildings, no less, but in other less tangible things like place names, which we shared. That's what I'm saying. So how are we to go about this? Well, of course, it's got to do with an acknowledgement that the framework could be a bit more flexible and a bit more nuanced. That's one thing, right? I don't know what you think. Yeah. Okay, I think, okay, I think um, we can take one, one last question from the floor. Uh, the lady at the back, please. I think um, my question follows on from your comment just then. Um, I suppose it's a bit of a political question, um, but this sort of oversimplification of heritage that you're talking about in terms of built heritage and street names, I'm assuming that it's a reflection of a political agenda which has um, stratified cultural groups, a very sort of complex um, society into much more simplistic groups. So by that same token, surely this reframing of heritage as something more diverse and more nuanced needs to come from like a political standpoint as well like surely that needs to be reflected in government policy which recognizes more than four major ethnic groups um, and recognizes a more complex diverse society i wonder if you could maybe just comment on that at all you want to answer that uh, highly charged political question <laughs> It's not, it's not highly charged. Actually, I mean, this is already discussed by so many scholars, you know? So it's not highly charged at all. And, and um, I don't know, sometimes, see, when, when I was doing a, a, a short article on this sometime back, I was wondering myself whether this really has to do with a political agenda, agenda to stratify or whether it had to do with the expediency of marketing for tourism and the models taken from elsewhere where Chinese are objectified, you know? So for example, Chinatown, the idea of Chinatown as a packaged tourism district comes from the US, whether you have San Francisco or Hawaii or wherever, especially in San Francisco because of the, the earthquake. So after the 1906 earthquake, the very racist uh, administration of San Francisco wanted to take the opportunity to drive out all the Chinese from the center of San Francisco. The Chinese landowners were very smart. They decided to Disneyfy themselves and added all those dragon type, uh, you know? 
And then they said, look, we are valuable. You are your tourism real estate. Don't drive us out. In the end, they succeeded until today. It's become so famous, right? One of the first Chinatowns to market itself like that, in that Disney-esque fashion, is San Francisco. After the 1906 earthquake, it spread like wildfire. Every other Chinatown now has a paifang. <laughs> it didn't used to be the case. If you go to Makassar 2006, they've made a Chinese paifang. Malacca now has several. I don't know, Penang is not going to build one, I hope. The whole of Penang is Chinatown. Lah. I know, lah, I'm, I'm, you see, it's not. Penang knows better than that. It knows it's diverse. Exactly. Answers from the ground, I mean... Do you want to say something, Robert? No, we don't have to. <laughs> well, I think we have a very distinguished person actually among the audience, Pamela. I think uh, if, if Pamela, you are in a sense responsible some of the very, I think... Yeah. Today you make it sound like a sin. But uh, anyway, I think uh, I was on the street name committee for over 10 years. And um, of course, there's always necessary redevelopment. But I cannot help but think, uh, this is embargo from the media, by the way. I cannot help but think that we don't know what we don't know. In other words, we have a whole generation of people that did not study humanities. They became scientists and engineers. And we didn't really bother to read a lot of novels and, and study what happened. It was only personal interest. And I remember when I joined this committee, I was shocked to see that they were using French names and they didn't even know that French and Spanish names have male and female, the la and le. So I brought it up and they went out and bought a dictionary. Okay, <laughs> But I think this, we've done a lot of things right and hopefully today we can refine it and do it a bit better and properly and address this. And I think all the information, um, some of the information that I've heard today, I, I think someone should know. I mean, even if they decide not to take the name, at least it's a decision, an option. What scares me is nobody addresses even an option. Somebody just pulls it up, what they fancy, what I like, or what I think sounds great. But I think as a nation, we should identify as much as we can. If we make a decision, you make it knowingly, not out of ignorance. Bravo. Okay. We have one last response. I think this is... Uh, uh, <laughs> really? Engine, please. Yeah. Um, I do need to um, make some comments in relation to Dr. Inran's comment. Um, and may I know how old are you, Dr. Inran? <laughs> He's young. <laughs> yeah, I'm very young. I'm 39. Okay, you're 39. So that you're born in which year then? <laughs> Sorry? Is this about me or is no, this no, about no, the you're... topic? <laughs> okay, 78. So no, 78. So it's very young. I am 71, and I was, and I was with URA for 34 years as a young girl. We walk the streets of Chinatown, Little India, Kampung Glam. Now, URA did not call these conservation areas such because of STB tourism. There were two things. Firstly, I think we do infer from the Raffles Town map, the early maps, where he assigned the different um, migrants, you know, to the different locality, such as the Chinese to the south of the river and the Malays to the north of the river and subsequently Little India came much later because there were this Kabao Road and so on where the Indians will be there, where the butchers, the, um, um, you know, and so on. Now that's the first part. The second part is because these were the, where the early migrants were assigned to and it continued. So if you walk Chinatown in the 50s and 60s. I was born in 1944, so I walked Chinatown in the 50s. 
So if you walk the streets, you know most of the residents there and businesses there are run by Chinese. And the um, trades are also mainly catering to the Chinese, such as Chinese medicine, herbal shop, clocks makers, um, you know, um, all the funeral, funerals, and so on and so forth. Now, in Kampong Glam, I think the Arabs were the early migrants there. But then you do find over time it evolves and you have this Arab street that sells all these textile material and so on. They cater, you know, to not just the Malay, but to the population at large. But most of the shops are run. I, I, I'm not sure about ownership, but they are run by, you know, uh, Malays or Arabs. Um, Little India, I would think that, you know, as, it, as the place evolved, there were, it's not that it has a lot of Indians as residents there, but there are many shops, in fact, operated by Chinese merchants, but they catered to the Indians' um, customers. And they are not local Indians. There could be um, visitors from other parts of the world and so on and so forth. So when we call these three locations by the name of Chinatown, Little India, Kampung Glam, I think it is, was not a tourism motored initiative. And I walk these streets, I walk the Arab streets, I go to Little India where the KK market used to be, the Tikka market, where most of the um, storeholders are Indians. And, and also some of the areas that you um, indicated we have not acknowledged them, but I think we did. For example, China Square. We know it is the China Square area, in fact, is much earlier than the um, Krita IA area when the development took place. But um, because it was immediately next to the CBD, so the land is considered a lot more prime, we could not save the entire area, but we took the approach of a mixture of old and new. We conserve selectively and we will combine this row of shop houses and sell with vacant land to create a high-rise, low-rise mixed development. For the um, beach, the um, Praspasa area, we did in a limited way conserve whatever we can certain streets, certain buildings, so that there is a mix of old and new. So we have to be selective. I think yesterday, Cho Mei did a presentation, and <clears throat> in her presentation, she did address that because we have limited land, limited land, yes, but you still see a lot of vacant land, yes, but we plan long term. So all these vacant land are planned for use over the next even 50 years and beyond. So we need to think long term, we need to do comprehensive planning and we need to be very selective. We don't do it in an ad hoc way so that we safeguard our long term interest and there is a land for growth of long term. But wherever we can, we try to continue to save them. For example, the three mosques that you mentioned at Palmer Road, the shrine and the uh, mosque. We recently, in fact, just deliberated at the URA Conservation Advisory Panel meeting, and I believe we will be looking forward to this being protected as conservation heritage. Yeah, thank you, because it's dangerous talking to a historian, because we look at sources that go even beyond before somebody old was born. So, for example, the, the last example... <laughs> that last example... The, the, you know, the mosque... Uh, at the base of the hill, the mausoleum on top, and the Hakka temple, they were all already get listed in the 1955 and 1958 street directory and master plan. But they were removed from the list later on. I mean, yes, that's why I'm saying. So you wouldn't know even though you lived in the 1950s, you have to check it out. And the oh, other Dr. Thing Imran, is, Dr. Imran. I mean, it's, it's not Dr. right to say, right, that there are a lot of Chinese shops in this area, therefore we can just call it Chinatown. Like, like that, then everywhere in Singapore is Chinatown, because 75%, 75%, every four percent you see, three are going to be Chinese, only one is going to be in a minority group. If you get a Tamil school here at Maxwell Road, that tells you a lot, Umapulava. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting. I think Dr. Ibrahim, it is, Coffee. 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 Coffee.
issue with stories in Singapore in the sense that for a long time, a lot of documents were not in the public domain. And I suppose we have to have a conversation. We only know so much about either past position. So I think that is why I think today, or this symposium, after so many years of not having one, it's really a chance to, I think, understand a bit more about what happened when, why, and from there to get lessons in the future to, I think, do things better. I think we are not perfect. We definitely have made trade offs, sometimes mistakes, because life is like that. But I think the most critical part is to then take the next journey to that better level. Because Singaporeans are like that, we demand of ourselves. I mean, uh, where is it? Didi was saying this morning, oh, you know, I'm saying this to you in Singapore because you guys have high standards, therefore I demand high standards. <laughs> so, but to get to the high standards, we need to go, we need to have the ability to have a conversation. Turn on the facts, the next. So, with that,